There we go. All right. We've got it. Okay. Well, my name is Chuck Maxson, and uh, I put together a little bit of a uh, story here. And now I need to, how do I, I, all I want to do is go to my next slide. Just as you would use a PowerPoint, you should be able to do it. Yeah, there we go. I'm going to talk a little bit about my medical history. Um, I graduated from Penn State in 1970. Um, I think most of you remember the 1970s included the Vietnam War, the lottery and the selective service. I had decided as a uh, junior that I wanted to apply to medical school. I had a lot of friends who were planning on going. And fortunately enough, I was accepted to Jefferson in Philadelphia in June of 1970, which pretty much guaranteed that I wouldn't get drafted. I married Tuffy in March of 1974, my senior year, and we traveled to the United Kingdom in 1974 for a month. Um, I finished the residency in Wilmington, Delaware, and I, we moved here in 1977. I enrolled at Jefferson in August of 1970, and I spent, I, developed a travel bug and ended up doing a rotation with an anesthesiologist in Madrid, Spain, <laughs> with three years of high school Spanish. Fortunately, he spoke very good English, and uh, I had a tremendously good time there. I lived in a dorm with other uh, college students. There, were some, there was a group of French students who were um, spending a couple of weeks in Madrid, actually a month, and uh, I had a really good time, and after that, I traveled to Portugal, Vienna, and visited family on my father's side Bar in Bardiov, Slovakia, and also family on my mother's side in Gloucester, England. In 1972, I went to Glasgow, Scotland for cardiology rotation, which was another important uh, event in my life. Uh, Glasgow is very much an industrial town. It felt like Pittsburgh, uh, where I was born and raised. And it had a very large number of patients with rheumatic heart disease, most of them because they lived in, in some difficult uh, situations and would catch rheumatic fever and then develop rheumatic heart disease. And 20, 30 years later, 40 years later, would be in the hospital because they had bad heart disease. It was a great experience. I want to talk a little bit about Jefferson. I don't know if any of you know this painting. This is by Thomas Eakins. It was painted in 1875, and it represents uh, Samuel Gross. This was the state of surgery in 1875. No gloves, no white coats. Um, they were operating on a um, teenager who had osteomyelitis of the bone. That's infection in the bone, and they were draining it. And Thomas... Uh, Samuel Gross was the, the surgeon. He's the, the portrait there. Uh, I'm not sure, but I, I believe Thomas Eakins is the person uh, just behind Sam Gross's uh, right shoulder. He painted himself in this painting. There's a story behind this painting. It's huge. It's eight feet by six and a half feet. I passed it almost every day, either going to classes or uh, going up to visit uh, the administration at, at the medical school. Um, you would walk up the steps and at the top of the steps, you would see this huge painting of Samuel Gross. It was actually paid for by alumni of Jefferson who bought it to honor Dr. Gross in 1875 or so. They actually put up the money and took over a year for him to paint it. Anyways, in 2006, the purchase of a painting was offered for $68 million. And the Jeffrey Board of, of Trustees accepted it. It was to be shared by the National Gallery of Art and the Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art in Bentonville, Arkansas. Bentonville, Arkansas is where Walmart is. It was uh, Sam Wal Walton's daughter who wanted to buy it. Anyways, it caused a huge controversy and the painting is still in Philadelphia. There was an effort to keep the painting. They were somehow able to raise the $68 million. 
and it now resides in the Philadelphia Museum of Art and shared with the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Art. This is another uh, uh, building in the Philadelphia area. This is the uh, College of Physicians building, the ACP. And in this building uh, is on 22nd Street. You can walk into it. Um, it's, it's open most every day. It includes the Muter Museum and Einstein's brain is there. After Tuffy and I got married, um, I had done some extra rotations. So I had, uh, we took off the month of May in 1974. I graduated then in June of 1974. And we traveled to the UK and we spent a week in London uh, visiting restaurants, museums, learning how to use the underground, wandered around. And on the advice of one of my professor friends at Jefferson, who was an anatomy professor, we visited the Hunterian Museum. Now, we've only been married about two months when we did this. Uh, we also spent time in Scotland and visited the cities of Edinburgh, Aberdeen, and Inverness. And we went back to visit some more family in Gloucester, England. The Hunteri Museum was uh, a collection by a Scottish surgeon. And surgeons are known as Mr. in the UK. They are, not they are a doctor. He has an MD degree. But all surgeons are traditionally called Mr. This comes from the fact that in the 15, 1600s and earlier, um, the only people who acted as a surgeon were barbers. And they kept the name of a Mr. Uh, I'll show you a skeleton here of the Irish giant, Charles Byrne from Ireland. He was uh, reportedly eight feet two inches tall. Um, that's him there. But you can wander around in here and uh, like the Hunterian Museum in London, it was a great place to visit to get some of the history of, uh, of medical care. What I really wanna talk about today is the Framingham study. I think many of you have heard about Framingham. It is a town west of Boston. Uh, it was a study to identify factors that predispose to cardiovascular diseases, including stroke, heart attack, and aneurysms. In 1945, FDR dies in April of a stroke. His blood pressure when he died was 300 over 190. Uh, I think that may be the highest blood pressure I've ever seen uh, documented anywhere. In 1932, his blood pressure was 140 over 100, and it ranged from 136 over 70 to 240 over 130 over the next four years. I am amazed that he lived as long as he did. In the 1940s, one in two Americans died of cardiovascular disease. In 1948, the year I was born, Harry Truman signed into law the National Heart Act to study the expression of coronary artery disease in a normal or unselected population and determine the factors predisposing to development of disease through clinical and laboratory workup and long-term follow-up. They requested $94,000 for office supplies and that included the ashtrays. Paul Dudley White and David Rutstein of Harvard and Massachusetts General Hospital were uh, advocates for this. Local physicians supported the study Hardy, Harvard cardiologists were nearby in Boston. And in addition, the, the population of Framingham had previously supported the Framingham tuberculosis study and voiced support for this. It was considered to be an ideal community because it, represent, it was a representative population of the United States. Gilson Meadows was the first director in 1947. The plan was to enroll 6,000 of the 10,000 adults. In 1948, the first patient was enrolled and it was the first long-term study of its kind. Ultimately, they enrolled 5,200 patients uh, with a random sample. These were not just volunteers who say, I wanna be the study. They actually offered uh, it uh, in a lottery. And this was just a copy of the letter from 1947, setting up the study. In 1971, the Framingham study was still going on. This was uh, 20 years later. 
it now included 5,100 of the children of the initial 5,200 individuals. So now we've got two generations. In addition, in 1994, ethnic diversity was addressed by en enrolling African Americans, Hispanics, Asians, Indian, Pacific Islanders, and Native Americans. And in 2002, the third generation has now been enrolled. And that includes 4,095 individuals and spouses were included in 2003. So it was a great study because it was a representation, a good representation of the American population. In 1957, blood pressure was typically defined as blood pressure of greater than 160 systolic over greater than 95 uh, of diastolic blood pressure. By that time, by the early 1960s, the uh, Framingham Health Study found that there was a fourfold increase in coronary heart disease in patients with hypertension. And later, they also demonstrated an increased risk for stroke with hypertension. And this is where all the, press, all the uh, information has come to really focus on checking people's blood pressures and treating it when, when appropriate. Normal blood pressure now is later defined as 120 over 80. In general, we think of the lower the better, as long as the patient is not symptomatic with uh, dropping their blood pressure when they stand up or they exert themselves. And uh, even for elderly patients, we tend to tolerate a lower blood pressure than what we're used to. We now know that by treating blood pressure, we reduce the incidence of heart attacks and strokes. In 1966, there was an effort to consider cutting the funds NIH uh, proposed to phase out the study in 1969 with 20 years of experience. However, uh, the people who were supporting this were uh, went to life insurance companies, the Tobacco Research Institute and the Oscar Mayer Company and got some grants from them to continue it. And in 1970, Nixon intervened and he has uh, renewed the study and the study continues today. In the 1970s, we believed systolic blood pressure was not that important and that labile of hypertension was not that important. But in the Framingham study, we have proved that systolic and diastolic blood pressures and labile hypertension are all important. And the most important is if we treat blood pressure, we reduce risk for heart attacks and stroke. The uh, Framingham risk scores in, include sex, race, and age, and I'm going to show you a calculator in a few minutes. It also includes a history of hypertension, a history of diabetes. Metabolic syndrome is considered to be a pre-diabetic event in, in, or diagnosis in many patients. It's also well known now that smoking and tobacco use, not just smoking, but chewing tobacco are also risk factors for heart disease and that hyperlipidemia is a risk factor for heart disease. We also consider in some of these calculators, the family history of premature cardio, uh, cerebral vascular disease or stroke, that's a heart attack in a male before the age of 55 and in a female before the age of 60. Chronic inflammation and chronic uh, inflammation diseases, including HIV, coronary calcium disease, chronic kidney disease, and obesity are also considered risk factors, although not as important as the top three or four. The risk score will calculate a risk for the development of heart disease, stroke, or transient ischemic attack, that's a warning stroke, and arterial aneurysm, uh, uh, and peripheral vascular disease, that's clogging of the arteries in the abdomen, clogging of the arteries in the arms and legs. The Framingham risk score applies to patients who have no previous history of cardiovascular disease. That's the one point that I wanted to make sure you understood. It applies to patients between the ages of 20 and 79, and certainly for patients over the age of 75 or 79, if you're going to treat them, you really need to have a discussion about the risks of your proposed treatment. Low risk is considered less than a 7.5% 10-year risk. Intermediate is 7.5 to 19.9%, and high risk is greater than 20%. However, if a patient has had a history of a heart attack or stroke, heart failure, TIA, aneurysm, peripheral vascular disease, Patients should be treated no matter what their score is. 
because once we know you have uh, atherosclerotic disease, it, it should be treated. And the variables are here. And let me just pull up this estimator. This is one of the ones that, that exists. This is from the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association. And I can put my numbers in. And I'm white, so there's sex, age, and race. Uh, my total cholesterol most recently. Hello? You're not on, Charles. Your, your uh, sharing is not on. We can't see it. Is it okay now? No. Did you see my no. previous slides? Yes. Yeah. And the, it, the risk uh, calculator is not showing up? No. Gray screen. Okay, hang on a second. I'm going to go back to the presentation and I'll click this link again. Oh. I think when you click the link, it changes what sh what's being shared. Ah, uh, you know what? So, I think Larry told me that. Yeah. So okay. hang on a second. Let me go back here. Okay. Mm -hmm. You can see that now. Yes. Now let me see if I can make it share the screen. You have to share screen again. Okay. Now Go where ahead. do I get share screen? Oh, here it is. A new share. There it is. Yes. You're on. That it. Okay. So let me go back here. I'm a male. I'm 72 this year. I'm white. My total cholesterol number. Well, let me use the one for uh, an earlier one. It was 187. That was before I took any medications for cholesterol. And my HDL cholesterol was 39. And my systolic blood pressure was 132. I, I do not have diabetes, I never smoked, and I do take blood pressure medicine. You can see up here that my risk is 26.5%, so I'm considered at high risk, primarily because of age. And if I, up, if I normalized everything, I, drop, I got my cholesterol numbers better, and I can change, I go back here and change my cholesterol numbers to what they are now, 121, and this was 37. Oh, I have to make it 130. It only goes to 130. And my most recent systolic blood pressure was 118. I've dropped the risk down to 23%. Now, if I put in there that I was a smoker, watch what happens. Uh, no, that's not right. That should uh, improve more than that. Okay. Anyway, is this maybe the, the wrong example to use? So now I'm going to go back to to share your screen again. Yeah, and I got to go back to find it. Should be on the bottom. There we go. Okay, but that's, okay. you want the other screen. Now I want to. You'll have choices of which screen to share. So to your PowerPoint. And I don't see the PowerPoint. Maybe close out of this browser. Okay.
There you go. Okay. There we go. Perfect. Well, let me talk a little bit about uh, treatment options. Um, oh, I did want to mention, I have a calculator on my phone. Anyone with a smartphone, you can download these uh, calculators. There are quite a few of them and they use different kinds of uh, uh, variables to, to, that you can place in, in them. Anyway, the treatment options. Um, first of all, for blood pressure, the treatment options are the standard blood pressure medicines. They make a huge uh, reduction in uh, risk. And they include things like diuretics and ACE inhibitors and ARB uh, agents. They include beta blockers, um, all of which bring the blood pressure down to a much more normal level. And the, it's been well shown in multiple studies that if you can get the blood pressure normalized, that greatly reduces the risks of having another heart attack or stroke. Other things to remember is diet, weight control, and regular exercise. I wanted to talk a little bit about statins. Um, I don't know how many of you may have heard of Chinese red rice extract. It's uh, the chemical name is a monocolon K and lovastatin was the very first um, statin that became a, a, available. Um, I've forgotten, it. I think it's Merck who has the patent on it and uh, they patented it. Now there are generics for it available, but it first came out about 25 years ago and it really has changed the way we treat high cholesterol and has greatly reduced heart attacks and stroke. The newer statins include atorvastatin and rosuvastatin. There's a lot of excitement about PCSK9 antibodies. This is a, an infusion. You would have to go to a, um, a doctor's office or a surgery center where they have I, access for IV to be placed. It's an infusion that uh, is a monoclonal antibody that actually uh, attaches itself to the precursors of LDL cholesterol and reduces LDL cholesterol, the bad cholesterol, by at least 60%. You have to have the infusions though once or twice a month and they are, uh, it's fairly expensive. This is for people who have these genetic predispositions for familial hypercholesterolemia. These are the people who have heart attacks in their teenage and 20 year olds. And it, it's possible that we can treat them. Uh, Omega-3 fish oils, lots of discussion about it. The newest one now is Vesepa. It is primarily uh, the uh, fatty acid uh, that, that I have listed here called EPA. And it's definitely, it, it has shown to reduce the chance for a recurrent heart attack in people with high triglycerides. Um, by about 25% over a four year period of time. I mentioned because I just started taking it just to see what it's gonna to do to my triglycerides. I first found out that I had high triglycerides when I was in my twenties. And uh, I have looked at this for years and years. Um, I did try taking some other fish oils that you can buy without a prescription that include EPA and DHA. Uh, however, they never really made much difference for me. EPA should make a, bigger difference. So in summary here, um, treatment of blood pressure, treatment of cholesterol and smoking sensation, cessation are the most important things that I can recommend to people to do to reduce the chances of developing heart attacks and stroke. Um, there, the as we started earlier on, your sex and your age and your uh, race, you can't change, but you certainly can change blood pressure and cholesterol numbers and you can get rid of the cigarettes. A healthy diet and exercise are important for everyone. I, I will recommend that everyone get uh, immunizations. And for, for this group, most of us who are at that age of considered geriatric, uh, it's very important to consider getting your flu shot the pneumonia shot, uh, tetanus with pertussis, whooping cough. We had an outbreak of whooping cough in Belfont in the high school uh, a couple years ago. And uh, elderly patients can lose their the protection they had when they were kids uh, from 
either having whooping cough or being immunized for it. Shingles, there's a great vaccine for shingles. It does require two shots. And if you're going to travel the, or the world, make sure you check out, see if you need any kind of uh, travel medications. I'll tell you a brief story. I went to uh, Ghana with my daughters and 25 Penn State college students uh, four years ago. We spent uh, a month in Ghana. I, I worked in a uh, medical clinic. And the students were there for the experience. They did a lot of good things uh, while they were there. And I found out in the airport that of the 25 Penn State students, 10 of them decided that they would not take malaria prophylaxis. It's a great study because the question that it answered is you take 25 students to a malaria country, how many of them get malaria? And the answer is two out of the 10 caught malaria. The other 15 um, Penn State students who went with us all took their malaria prophylaxis, including me and my daughters, and we were all fine. The two students who got malaria came back to State College, and within a week of returning from Ghana, they were at the emergency room at Mount Nittany. One was life flighted to the University of Pennsylvania for treatment. The other one was life flighted to the University of Pittsburgh for treatment of malaria. Okay. Well, I think that pretty much ends it. And how about if I open it up for any questions? Charles, could you comment on blood thinners? Certainly. Certainly anyone who has heart disease or a stroke probably should be on aspirin for the rest of your life. 81 milligram baby aspirin, very safe. In men, it slightly increases the chances of a bleeding stroke, but it it prevents far more clotting strokes than uh, it you causes bleeding strokes. In women, the, the information is not quite so clear. The, uh, the National Nurses Study did a study on it and it's, it's probably helpful. And certainly if you've had a heart attack, it's well worth considering taking. Now the other blood thinners to consider is particularly if you have atrial fibrillation, then you should probably be on a much stronger blood thinner uh, warfarin, Coumadin uh, is the standard. And of course, there are the new novel anticoagulants um, that are available that many people can take. If you have atrial fibrillation, that's very important because the risk of a stroke from clots with atrial fibrillation is uh, significant. And uh, I, I make sure that every patient knows that that's a possibility, that, that they should take some sort of blood thinner. Eliquis is one of those new novel ones. It works very well, one pill a day. The risk of bleeding is, is slightly higher, but it's, it's reasonable. Well, if there are any other people who would like to ask questions, please unmute yourself and uh, ask. I was wondering, I was wondering about uh, variations in blood pressure. Because you yep. mentioned you mentioned blood pressure limits, you know that uh, that are considered normal, right? But blood pressure varies throughout the day, even if you're at rest. And I agree. In my, in my own blood pressure, I've seen some pretty big variations, you know, with systolics that might go between, you know, 125, 130, and, and 150 or 158. So what what do you read into the variations? Um. Like I mentioned earlier, um, we would used to we used to call that labile hypertension. Sometimes you put a cuff on somebody and their blood pressure would be 150 over 98, and then other times it'd be 110 over 80, which is normal. Um, labile hypertension has been shown that if you follow these people over time, mo many of them will develop um, sustained hypertension. Blood pressures are always somewhat high. Um, our bodies do an incredible job at maintaining the blood pressure at what it needs to be, but occasionally things get out of whack, either because of kidney problems or heart problems, um, and it'll go a little higher. And of course, if you exercise, you will get somewhat higher blood pressures. Uh, 
However, people who exercise regularly usually have a more normal blood pressure. And part of that is probably because they also can maintain a, a better weight, an ideal weight, which definitely helps. Sometimes just losing 10 pounds makes a, a difference between uh, having uh, blood pressure you consider treating and, and being normal. Thanks. So Charles, I have a question. Um, what's the best way to keep track of your uh, blood pressure? Are there apps you can use? Uh, I had mine taken at a visit to a, a dentist, and but I don't remember what it was she told me, and I didn't write it down. So. Sure. Um, <clears throat> Um, I have people buy a blood pressure cuff. And the one I usually recommend is called Omron, O-M-R-O-N. Uh, Walmart sells it. Um, their, their name for it is, uh, it's made in the Omron factory and it, they just relabel it as rely on. It's an, a blood pressure cuff on your upper arm. It comes with a cuff that's wide enough and long enough to take care of most arms. If you have a very big arm, you, you do need a wider and longer cuff to have on. They typically are self-inflating and they have a transducer uh, at the, uh, the crease of your elbow, measure the blood pressure of the brachial artery, and they're very accurate. Um, I will frequently have people bring their blood pressure cuff in and the nurse will take their blood pressure with our cuff and then with theirs. And it's, it's always within a few millimeters of uh, blood pressure. And I think if you have high blood pressure, it's a good thing to have around and just check it on your own different times of the day. You don't have to do it routinely or regularly, but I have one patient who does it every day, twice a day. And he, he, he gets on the internet and he sends me an email with the number. So a follow-up question to that is on keeping track of your cholesterol. So uh, my uh, GP says, well, you know, you have borderline high cholesterol. You ought to do something about that. Didn't bother to say what to do. So I uh, cut out cheese and butter. Yeah, it helps a bit. Uh, maintaining a, an ideal weight helps. Exercise will help too. The, if one of the reasons to use the Framingham risk calculator is to see what your risk is. Now, when you get to be over 65 and 70, your risk is gonna be high. And some doctors might well argue that maybe we should just put the statin in the water, like fluoride, and then that way everyone will get it. I, I, I don't think that's a particularly good idea, but um, what I usually do is uh, I talk to the patient about it. We, I look at their BMI and uh, talk about their exercise, uh, make sure that they get some aerobic exercise regularly, couple, three times a week for 20, 30 minutes is ideal for everyone. I always tell the story, if you see pictures of uh, New York City, Philadelphia, at the turn of the century, 1900, you see people walking on the sidewalk and none of them are fat. There are no cars in the street. There are no restaurants at every corner. They exercise because they had to walk to work. And the incidence of uh, obesity has increased mainly because we're not nearly as active as what we used to be. Um, but doing the, the risk uh, calculator by putting in your risk factors and uh, checking see what your cholesterol numbers are, can give you an idea of, well, what's your risk? If, if it's you know be lower than seven and a half percent, and that's probably the, for many people, uh, that's, that's considered okay. If it's higher than seven and a half, then you should have a discussion. And certainly if it's over 20%, you definitely need to have a discussion about what would be most appropriate for you. Chuck. Sure. Yes. Roger Williams here, if I may, uh just ask you, I recently um, had a number of tests run and the only thing that was out of kilter was my cholesterol, which was 210. I've never had high cholesterol before and was rather shocked by, by the result. What level should it be at for me to uh, not have a classified? Yeah, ideally if it's less than 200, that's good. And certainly the lower, the better. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the HDL or the LDL cholesterol? Uh, I don't. I was looking for the chart as you were speaking, and I just couldn't find it. Yeah. Okay. Well, H 
HDL cholesterol is the good cholesterol, the higher the better. There, the, it's my, mainly genetically determined, which means you ch if you chose the right parents, you typically have a good HDL cholesterol. Mm -hmm. That okay. tends to run in families. The LDL cholesterol is, is the, the bad cholesterol. And that's the one that most of the treatment uh, we focus on is to try to get the LDL cholesterol down. Okay. Charles, uh, John Gulbeck. Yep. If, you're, if you're right on the edge of needing to take statins, one of the things that you always worry about is, uh, are the side effects. Right. What, 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 what are the side effects of using statins? And, you know, and because that, that always enters into making the decision whether you should start or not. Right, it does. And that statins are incredibly well tolerated by most people. There are people who do develop some problems, including muscle pain. Um, we have cholesterol in our bloodstream because we need cholesterol. It's a building block for muscle and all the cells in our body. However, if you have the wrong kind of cholesterol, the higher LDL cholesterols, that greatly increases your risk for developing atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis is basically the deposition of oxidative um, cholesterol into the wall of the artery. And over time, it calcifies, um, it uh, clogs the artery. And we know that for people who have heart attacks, you know, when we check them, we find out, yeah, you had a heart attack because one of your arteries was really clogged. Mainly what I'm talking about now is how do you make that decision about putting someone on a cholesterol lowering medicine? Well, you, part of it involves, let's check the cholesterol numbers and see what they are. And let's do the calculation with the calculator based on Framingham. And if you've had a heart attack or a stroke, and I've had a stent put in four years ago, um, and I haven't had any problems, but the, my cardiologist immediately put me on a statin, and I've been taking it ever since for the past four years. And I, fortunately, I'm still in good shape and haven't had any more problems with it. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Charles, me here. Um... I'm just wondering, I, I'm at the doctors all the time. I've got type two diabetes, so I'm seeing a doctor for that. Yep. I also have high cholesterol. I also have glycoma. It just seems like every time I go in, <laughs> I'm getting my blood pressure checked. And I'm, just, I'm just wondering, like for a typical person that's over 65, and I'm also getting my uh, hemoglobin A1C checked all the time. Yep. They, you know, so they just seem like they're on top of me all the time. but. For somebody that is healthy, unlike me, is, is there a standard recommendation of how often they should go to the doctors and what kind, what the panel should be? Like, should everybody get their cholesterol checked every year or half year or? No, not nearly that often. Really? Um, okay. Yeah, there, there are some familial high cholesterol genetically determined uh, illnesses that is passed down in families. And for those families that we get an early history of a heart attack, such as a, uh, a man with a heart attack before age 55, a female with a heart attack uh, before age 60, I would check teenagers once and then probably would not check it again until age 30. Okay. Unless there's a family history suggesting maybe we need to keep a closer eye on it. For diabetes, the current recommendation is to have that hemoglobin A1C to be checked twice a year, every six months. Right. Um, so in, for checking the cholesterol, I get mine checked once a year. Yeah, mine's probably twice a year. Yeah, and you know, my, I'm controlled with medications. I don't have any problems. It's been normal ever since I started taking the statin four years ago. And my doctor doesn't think I need to have a check more than that. Right. The one side effect, getting back to John Goldberg's question, as, as far as taking statins, and I just read online, there may be memory loss. Yep. So for a while there, I was really resistant until my doctor just really lectured me that with your diabetes, on top of everything else, everything just amplified. Yep. And so, so I'm, I'm, I'm on my daily dose. Um, and who knows, 
I can't remember if my memory's getting worse. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, having trouble, uh, you know, I, I have trouble remembering people's names. I've always had that, but right. I certainly notice it more now. And it's just because I, I like to think that my brain is just full. That's right. And in order for me to remember something, I have to get rid of something else. <laughs> hard, the hard disk is a fool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm also struggling with the uh, issue of statins. Yep. My cholesterol is not high. It's not super low. It's around 190 to 200. Um, it's the, the, the thing, the, 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 the side effect that I'm concerned, I'm going to get tar player. I'm a lifelong guitar player. Yep. Every guitar player I've known who has taken statins has had trouble with their fine motor control. Okay. So yeah. I have been resisting it. And basically, when I talked to my physician about this, uh, who recently retired, he said, I said, is it, my, my cholesterol isn't high. Other factor, I exercise five, six hours a week, minimum. I work out like a maniac. Uh, my weight is within normal limits. And, and, I, and, I, and I put it to him, he says, well, what's the ma major risk factor for me? He, I, I said, it looks to me, looking at all the data that I've looked at, is that I'm 65 or older. He said, that's true. Yep. He said, that's the issue. Yep. Um, and that the, the real issue with the, the statins was the protective value on the heart, not the lowering of cholesterol. Because yep. my cholesterol was not high. Yep. Anyway, comment. Have you ever had any heart trouble? Uh, the only issue I had was a couple of paroxysmal atrial fibs that went away immediately. Okay. And, uh, no, nothing okay. like that. I, yeah. I mean, I run, <laughs> I well, you're doing, you're clearly you're doing all the right things. Um, you know, smoking is a big risk factor. So I tell people, you know, whatever you can do to stop smoking, that'll be the best th favor you'll do yourself ever. Got out of that a long time ago. Yep. So, you know, I, when I started off this, this presentation, um, the, the one caveat that I wanted to make sure that everyone realizes that, is that once you have been diagnosed with heart problems because of clogged arteries or because a heart attack or a stroke, then you really should consider taking a statin. Now, there are some other medicines that maybe will work pretty well. And certainly they work particularly well when you have high cholesterol numbers and high LDL cholesterols. But once you get your LDLs down under a hundred or so, um, then your, your risk for having problems are really quite a bit less. Chuck, you haven't mentioned uh, red wine. I've been waiting for that. <laughs> <laughs> I like red wine too. <laughs> um, I don't drink it every day. I also enjoy an occasional beer. Um, certainly for the, you know, the studies that have been done in the Mediterranean, you know, a, a diet that's high in fish and shellfish and high in uh, olive oil and red wine all contribute to a longer lifespan for people who live in the Mediterranean area. All right, I'll keep drinking then. Good. Yep. <laughs> Well, if there's no other questions, let me apologize. Uh, we still don't know exactly what the problem was. Uh, Larry made sure I started the meeting, then he signed off to start his meeting. And uh, I'll talk to Larry and uh, hopefully this will never happen again. Um, but it could have been, like I mentioned, perhaps there were more, there were too many signings from the, um, Port your count or something, but we'll, we'll troubleshoot it. Okay. The other thing it, is, it looks like Art's trying to get say something. Art oh, Goldstein. Right. Go ahead, Art. It occurred to me that some of you are going to ask after this meeting adjourns, why didn't we ever talk about whether we want to continue using Zoom or whether we want to go back to the uh, Ramada Inn? I was yeah. about to ask that myself. Is that something yeah. you want, Mr. President? That's really your your call. Do you want, yeah. do you want to discuss well, that tonight? Okay, let me just discuss it free, uh, uh, briefly. Uh, I think, at least for the June meeting, I don't remember who the speakers were, but the speaker in the June meeting has indicated he's willing to go ahead and, and uh, talk in person. 
Um, I don't really, uh, I think a good percentage of us with our age group, were probably already vaccinated. I got my second shot this past, about 10 days ago, all right? And so even if just half of us would like to meet uh, in person, uh, I think that'd be worthwhile giving it a go and trying to figure out the details on how to do Zoom and be able to be in person at the Ramada Inn. And I guess it comes down to um, some other issues as far as catering, which I think we can work out. They can, they can cater. I'm sorry, what? They can, they can, they can okay. serve food. They cannot serve food. Yeah. But, you know, so, as you know, so many of us have COVID fatigue, and the CDC has indicated for those people that are vaccinated, you can certainly get together uh, without, uh, without masks and, and have dinner together. So I like to at least aim for the June meeting. Uh, I can send out a doodle pool uh, to see who would be willing, or would, not willing, but would want to meet in person so we can get an idea. Okay, go ahead, Arthur. In your poll, ask people if they have completed their vaccinations. Okay. Or intend yeah. to. Yeah, I would imagine most of us have. Uh, I'm not That's sure. About, yeah, I don't think we'll get together in person in April. I would. I don't. I want to try to go for June, and then we'll see about May. But I'll send out a doodle poll. All right. Roger Williams will be speaking in June. Okay. All right. Okay. I think Roger <laughs> replied to me that he. he He's been vaccinated and he'd be willing to talk. So I would look forward to that so that we can at least start to kind of alleviate ourselves from this fatigue, Zoom, uh, fatigue um, COVID fatigue or Zoom fatigue and start seeing each other in person for a little bit. Uh, Ming, this is, Ming, this is Jim Altman. Uh, I had written an email in response to your questions about uh, having it in person. And originally I was really uh, I felt unsure about, and I'm the speaker for April. I was unsure of okay. doing an in-person meeting in April until I saw Art's description of the ground rules that uh, Ramada has laid out. I think their ground rules, uh, given their ground rules, plus the, as you indicated that many of us are either vaccinated now, and certainly by June, most of us will be vaccinated. I think that, as I say, that their ground rules seem sane to me now. Okay. The problems yeah. I see, the problem I see is, is, is the technological problem if we are going to be in a large space like the atrium. Yeah. Trying to reach everybody with the audio and having decent projection on a screen is going to be more difficult. And if we want to do a simultaneous, simultaneous Zoom meeting, so the people that can't or don't want to be there right. uh, can see it. That, that is even more complicated to pull yeah. off in a large room. So my concern now is not so much the safety, but the deliverable, you know, in terms okay. of- Okay, well, I'll tell you what, let me, I think I could volunteer Arthur. Let Arthur and I work on this to see what we can come up with as far as your concerns, uh, Jim, uh, they're very good and sound concerns. But I think many of us really want to make a push to see if it can meet in person. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's, and so let me see if I can address these things. Um, they certainly should have a public address system that would work. They do. They do. really do. Okay. Uh, I, 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 after I read Jim's uh, letter, I, I checked with them. And they also, if we really, really had everybody vaccinated, they put us in the back in the terrace room. Really? Okay. Um, I mean, there's a side of me that says that if you're not vaccinated, we really don't want you there. Even though everybody is an adult, I'm not sure what the regulations are, but I just don't want it to be on my watch that somebody that's not vaccinated would get COVID at a function that uh, I'm at least presiding over as much as I can as a president. But let me send out, how about if I send out the Zoom, uh, not Zoom, um, you know, the, the doodle pool to, to see how many people are vaccinated first. Maybe that's the first doodle pool. All right. And then uh, then we'll get an idea of really what, what the numbers are. Okay. Does that sound good? Yes. And yes. today's talk was just great. Yeah, I love it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank yes. you so much. Oh, yeah. Great.
So yeah, I want to thank you uh, for that. Uh, again, I'm really sorry. I don't even know what went wrong, but I'm glad we were able to meet. I was all, almost ready to call it off, but then somehow I guess Larry and John were able to put it together. But I couldn't even get in for a while. So, all right. Thank Anything you. Else? Anything else? Well, well, thank, thank you for you. that talk. Thank you. Everybody stay safe. Stay all right. Safe. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.